Unitarian Congregation. Uh, my name is Greg Monk. I will be leading our service today. Um, it's good to be here and um, to be here live as well as um, online. We have a few folks with us this morning practicing social distancing, so it's good to see you. Um, here you will find a diverse and inclusive spiritual community where we welcome people with many beliefs. You can bring your whole self, your full identity, your questioning mind, and expansive heart. Here, um, at All Faiths, we have more than one way of experiencing the world and understanding the sacred. And most importantly, no matter who you are, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, and no matter whom you love, you are welcome here. We have a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, we have our 10 o'clock scholar coming up Wednesday the 24th at 10 a.m. on Zoom. Uh, Reverend C.J. McGregor will be leading the program, and there will be a discussion on what is God. It's based in Genesis. There will be a coffee chat on the following day, Thursday the 25th at 11.30 on Zoom. Um, and that's what I have for announcements. I guess we're going to start by singing together hymn number 361, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In.
When we are together, we share our joys and sorrows that we have felt with our congregation. And while we are apart, we still have the opportunity to share those joys and sorrows. If you have a joy or sorrow that you would like to share with our congregation, please make sure that you contact me and I'll be sure to include it in our service. Please keep Edie Griffiths in your hearts and minds. She had a fall and a small injury. I spoke to her this morning and she's doing much better. Uh, Natalie Hahn has moved to Calusa Harbor. So uh, get in touch with her and ask her how, how it's going and offer her support. Patty Hart, who is the partner of uh, Julie Simmons, uh, had a fall and an injury. Uh, please keep her in your hearts and minds. We have some birthdays this week. Richard Keelan, John Davidson, and Cameron Anholt. But we have a special birthday, someone who is with us this morning, Janet Falk, turns 85. 86? 86. Usually people go down. But... 86. So let us offer her our congratulations. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Janet. Happy birthday to you. some opening words from our reverend. It is now that we are called witnesses of the world to mend it, to change its course, and to restore it. It is now when we are called to act on our Unitarian Universalist values. Not to hide, not to fear, but to be bold and to be loud. It is now that we are called to continue our fight for justice, to organize, to speak up. It is now. It is now, and let us gather, let us give each other courage. It is good to be together. <laughs> No. 
through the trees, as I know the blood that flows in my veins. We are a part of the earth, and the earth is a part of us. The perfumed flowers are our sisters. The bear, the deer, the great eagle, these are our brothers. The rocky crests, the meadows, the ponies, all belong to the same family. The voice of my ancestors said to me, Every shining water that moves in the rivers and streams is not simply water, but the blood of your grandfather's grandfather. Each ghostly reflection in the clear waters of the lakes tells of memories of the life of our people. The water's murmur is the voice of your great-great-grandmother. The rivers are our brothers. They quench our thirst. They carry our canoes and feed our children. You must give to the rivers the kindness you would give to any brother. The voice of my grandmother said to me, Teach your children what you have been taught. The earth is our mother. What befalls the earth befalls all the sons and daughters of the earth. Hear my voice and the voice of my ancestors, Chief Seattle said. This we know. All things are connected like the blood that unites. Now let us join in singing hymn number 317, We Are Not Our Own. The words are printed in your order of service.
the theme for our our messages this month is mercy and so we've been talking about having mercy for ourselves mercy for others but this morning I think it's important for us to talk about having mercy for our planet when I was barely 18 I left home for the army and I never returned and I attended university and then I moved to New York City and when I say I never returned home I mean I literally never went back. I did not go back to my hometown or visit my family for many years. Now, there is certainly a story within there, but for another time. Years later, when I did return home, it was for short periods of time, and I only visited a few select people. Interestingly, when I arrived home, people stopped what they were doing, made time for me, and we celebrated. And today, I gladly return home, still visit those select few people, and I always receive a grand reception. And the news that CJ is in town travels fast. It's good to be loved, and it's good to be celebrated. My experience reminds me, the experience I just shared with you, reminds me of the story of the prodigal son found in the Gospel of Luke. The parable begins with a man who had two sons, and the younger of them asked his father to give him his share of the, his inheritance, a share of the estate. And the implication is that the son could not wait for his father's death, for his inheritance. He wanted it immediately. And the father agrees, and he divides his estate between both sons. And upon receiving his portion of the inheritance, the younger son travels to a distant country and wastes all his money in extravagant living. He took a trip to Las Vegas, you could say. And immediately thereafter, a famine strikes the land and he becomes desperately poor and is forced to take work uh, as a swine herd. This too would have been repulsive to Jesus' Jewish audience who considered swine unclean animals. And when he reaches the point of envying the food of the pigs he is watching, he finally, he finally comes to his senses. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare? And here I perish with hunger. I will arise, I will go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy, worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And so he arose and he came to his father, but when he was a great way off, his father saw him and he had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. This implies that the father was hopefully watching for the son's return. In most versions of the Gospel of Luke, the son does not even have time to finish his rehearsed speech before his father accepts him back wholeheartedly without hesitation. And as the father calls for his servants to dress him in a fine robe, to slaughter the fatted calf for a celebration and for a celebratory meal, the older son who was at work in the fields hears the sound of celebration and is told about the return of his younger brother. And he is not impressed and becomes angry. He also has a speech for his father. And he said to his father, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time your commandment, and yet you never gave me a kid, a fatted calf that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as your son came, who devoured thy living with harlots, you killed for him the fatted calf. The parable concludes with the father explaining that because the younger son had returned, in a sense, from the dead, celebration was necessary. And the youngest son had been lost and now is found. So let us think about the facts and the lessons within this story in the Gospel of Luke. The son wanted to live independently of his father. He was restless and rebellious. 
And he demanded and received his inheritance and promptly left the father's home in search of what he thought was real living. We all may have children like that. The son discovered that life apart from the father was not all it was cracked up to be, that the, the pastures were not greener, and freedom, freedom came at a high price. In fact, the far country, the young man quickly squandered his inheritance and found himself broke, friendless, and desperate, with seemingly no way out of his predicament. And his destitution led to degradation of his person expressed by living in a pig pen. But something beautiful happens in the story because the young man finally comes to himself. He comes to his senses. And he hits rock bottom and realizes the errors of his ways. He remembers how good he had things when he was in his father's house and repents of his sin against his father. And he determines to return to the father's home. What he finds when he returns home is probably not what he expected. I'm sure he expected a long lecture and some punishment. But the loving father with outstretched arms received and restored him to full rights and privileges of sonship. There was redemption and there was rejoicing. And the father was there all along waiting for his son to return home and I believe there was a, never a day that went by the father thought, maybe today, maybe today will be the day my son comes home. For me, this story is about a breakdown in relationship. Think about it. What would you do in such a situation? Would pride prevent you from returning home or restoring the relationship? Would stubbornness push you? Toward self-destructive behavior such as addiction or perhaps you might feel your parent no longer loved you and would not want you back. This parable is also about each of us. The story is about each of us. A father stands waiting for the time when his child will at last realize the need for a lasting and satisfying relationship with him. And so too dies our planet, waiting, watching each day when we will return and want to reconnect and re-enter in loving relationship with the planet. It's easy for me to reflect on the story and think about our relationship with the planet. Reconciliation with our planet is possible. All prodigals come home. All prodigals come home. Reconciling with Mother Nature is a theological concept. How can humanity create peace with planet Earth is a theological question. And we Unitarian Universalists understand this concept and wrestle with this question, this idea of making peace with the planet. And this idea of making peace with the planet came to me after reading uh, Barry Commoner's book, Making Peace with the Planet. Tells you what's inside, doesn't it? <laughs> Commoner argues that despite billions of dollars spent to save the environment of America, America is still deep in environmental crisis. Author Deborah Bronson tells us, even if we declare a truce today and start to live more sustainably, it will take decades, if not centuries, for Earth to recover. But this is no reason for us not to create peace and have mercy on our planet in the here and now, the space that Unitarian Universalists occupy, the here and the now. And like the prodigal son, it is time for us to leave the Las Vegas of our living and come home to restore and to reconcile in our oceans Two-thirds of commercially harvested fish species are overexploited. By the year 2030, there will be more plastic than fish in the sea. Coastlines are eroding and cities are sinking at sea levels right here at home in Florida. Mangroves and reefs that ordinarily protect them are either being cut down or are dying from climate-induced changes like rising sea temperatures. 
And because of the greenhouse gases pouring into the atmosphere every day, our planet is heading for a three degrees Celsius to a five degrees Celsius rise in global temperatures that will wreak havoc on our health, wealth, our world, the marginalized, especially affected. And living out of balance with the environment is culminating in a pressing existential crisis. Instead, imagine waking up every morning with the intention to make peace, to make peace with the planet. And each of us can be the change we need by pushing our leaders in the public and private sectors to be better stewards of the earth. Investing in green infrastructure can solve our energy and infrastructure needs while restoring biodiversity, which has suffered over recent decades. And we need to connect global finance with climate risks. We need to connect global finance with climate risks. Financial markets need to finally start aligning investments with their actual costs and benefits to people and the planet. And I say put the cost of planetary destruction and pollution where it belongs, on those who cause it. I intend to make peace with the planet by choosing wise and compassionate actions, from how I spend money, to which places I visit, and to what leaders and causes I support. Aligning action with intent is our Unitarian Universalist call. Aligning action with intent will build inner peace, and it will build a better world. Peace, after all, comes with choosing to do what is right. Peace comes by choosing what to do is right. I recently read this quote by activist Carl Mayer. He said, the experience of my whole life tells me that we in America must learn to live in a radically different way. We must consume less, destroy less, and share the wealth of the earth in, with all that is alive around us, or we cannot have lasting peace with all who need to survive and thrive with us on the same planet. When we degrade the natural world, when we desecrate creation, however you understand creation, we commit a crime of the first order when we dis, uh, dishonor our planet by corrupting and polluting what we were entrusted to care for. Mercy, immediate mercy for the planet is what we are being called to do to offer mercy to the planet. Some are probably saying that I'm preaching to the choir this morning, and I recognize that to be true. But the intent of this message was to remind you of our commitment to the earth as Unitarian Universalists, but also to inspire you, to challenge you, to go further, go out and change hearts and minds in the name of mercy, in the name of peace. And if we can't appeal to others with science in creating peace, surely appealing to morality in creating peace will take us further. I leave you with the words of Quaker George Fox. He wrote, we call upon friends to examine their own lives to see if their own patterns of consumption reflect self centeredness and greed rather than a concern for a living for living harmoniously in the creation that we might witness to the world that harmony we call upon the nations of the world he wrote and in particular our own governments to enact laws and to reach agreements which will protect protect the creation from the effects of human exploitation greed and carelessness like the prodigal son, our planet has hit rock bottom. Like the prodigal son, let us come to our senses. Let us realize the errors of our ways. Return to relationship with the earth. And may we have mercy for a prodigal planet. Prodigals do come home. May it be so.
if you're watching for the first time or you've forgotten, you'll know that oh, I'll tell you that I like to share a joke before the offertory because laughter makes you generous, scientifically proven. <laughs> but first, I'd like to thank you for your generosity, for your offering to the congregation so that we may live our values and our mission in the community and our world. If you'd like to make a donation to the congregation and offering, please use the information that's posted below this message. A little Unitarian Universalist girl was sitting on the curb in front of her house when a set with a sad look on her face, and an older woman came up to her uh, and asked uh, who she was and why she looked so sad. What happened? What may what is making you so sad? And the girl replied, My kitty cat died. And the older woman, trying to be helpful, and uh, said to the little girl, I know you're sad, but Right now, your little kitty cat is with Jesus. And the Unitarian Universalist girl cringed her nose for a second and replied, what would Jesus want with a dead cat? <laughs> the morning offering will now be given and received.
CJ for his inspirational message, Joseph Brower for the beautiful music this morning, Regina Kilmartin for operating the camera, and Ed Elrod on sound. And of course, we appreciate all of you, whether you are joining us in person or virtually this morning. It is good to be connected and to stay together in whatever way we can. If you would now help us close up the service by reading the words for extinguishing the chalice that are found in your order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world. Mm -hmm. 